Coming up. Armored combat with Cherokee Nation giant Cole Fowler. How a knight's chivalry lives on. People tell me the longer you're around me, but the smaller I seem. Plus, Cherokee National Treasure Verl Keeter rocks. Oh, shit, done. Done it. That's a good draw. Learn from a flint napping master. And finally, sisters Taylor and Britt Hensel on an emotional mission of self discovery. Just didn't think that this was going to be like this. Now I'm really excited. <laughs> turning their cultural journey into an empowering film. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning, growing, succeeding and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation and OCO TV. We are so proud to share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, at Lake Tin Killer in Cherokee County, Oklahoma. He's a gentle giant, a Cherokee warrior who digs deep to find his inner strength and take the fight all the way back to medieval times. Cole Fowler introduces us to his passion, armored combat. All right, you got both captains on the field this time. Cole out in front of the Tulsa Tyrants. Cole is a giant of a man. I'll tell you what, he towers over most fighters out there. My name is Cole Fowler and I'm an armored combat fighter. I always knew I was a little bit bigger than everyone, but I've always been a really, you know, nice person and people tell me the longer you're around me, but the smaller I seem. Growing up, I got into football in the third grade and that was really, I think, a turning point in my life where I, uh, you know, kind of found my identity and like learned to be more confident in myself. Following that path, you know, I played high school football and was able to make the All-State team and got recruited to Dartmouth to play. In high school, uh, alongside playing football, I started playing uh, foam sword fighting, basically. And that kind of, you know, developed my interest in medieval combat. Growing up, my mom was raising me and my sister and at times, um, she put me in dangerous situations, not knowing, you know, basically like made me a victim of violence from someone. The trauma that happened to me kind of put me in a shell for a while. Through football and sword fighting, I've been able to kind of crawl back out and, you know, be more confident. Normally, I'm a pretty nice guy, uh, but in high school, my coach had to actually teach me how to psych myself up and tap into that aggression to be as effective as I could be. My aggressiveness is a, a big tool that I've been able to use, so it definitely translates into the, the armored combat. While playing football in college, I saw videos online of people, you know, fighting for the U.S. team overseas, like uh, classic rock like, you know, playing along to it. And just from the moment I saw it, like, just something clicked in my mind and it was just like, I'm gonna, gonna work on doing this someday, you know? I kind of got thrusted into it, like, right into the, like, the hottest fire you can put yourself in. Uh, went to one tournament and tried out and then made 
one of the top teams and was going to Portugal like two months later fighting international teams. I was voted uh, the Rookie of the Year, so that was a really big honor and uh, also just, you know, made me feel like I'm on the right path. And we ended up starting our own team based out of Tulsa to start competing against other cities all around the nation. We're called the Tulsa Tyrants. Uh, our mascot is a, a fighting rooster. Uh, we were gonna be Tyrannosaurus Rexes, but that was not medieval enough, apparently. Before a battle, I try to, you know, listen to music that's gonna focus my mind. And, and really, it's just kind of like psyching myself up into a, you know, violent state. You can't be smiling and laughing because you, you have to go punch a guy as hard as you can. The adrenaline really creates a whole different mood too. Uh, like a lot of the hits you take, you can't even really feel them. And you'll come out of the, the list and five minutes later, 10 minutes later, like it'll wear off and you'll feel like maybe you got hit somewhere you didn't even like think about it or perceive. Stamina is a huge part of the sport and working out and getting into shape is a must. So you're in, you know, 60 to 80 pounds of armor usually. It gets really sweaty because you're wearing essentially quilted clothing underneath all the metal. A lot of times people get uh, cuts on their faces from their helmet getting, you know, punched into it. But for the most part, uh, you know, you come out pretty whole if your armor is working well and doesn't get broken. I kind of think about fighting as like a therapeutic activity for me. You know, tapping into those negative emotions and like exerting yourself and sweating and getting to uh, throw some punches around. Also just uh, measuring myself against other, other people has always been a great thing in my life. It's been a good reason to, you know, get me off the couch and motivated me to be a better me, you know? The thing about being a knight in the Armored Combat League is that you're not better than anyone. It means being in service, you know, to the people around you, to your community, the whole chivalrous idea. The way it translates into my life, I think, is I always try to be available to protect people who would, you know, need it. My day job has been uh, working in the government relations department at Cherokee Nation. Uh, a lot of times we're traveling around doing outreach. Uh, you know, other kids are experiencing violence and poverty. All things that I struggled with as a kid, you know, it's been rewarding getting to, you know, work alongside other tribal citizens uh, to make an impact on those issues. When I was a kid growing up, oftentimes, you know, I felt in harm's way. And uh, that kind of uh, made me want to be there for, you know, people who are helpless. I think that's part of, you know, kind of the idealism of chivalry and uh, having a goal of being a good person and, you know, holding yourself to uh, a high standard. Growing up in the hills of northeastern Oklahoma, Verl Keeter fell in love with flint napping. Now, decades later, as a Cherokee National treasure, his knowledge of rock formations and the stories they tell is second to none. My first slogan was rocks, rocks, and, and more rocks. But I love them, I love to do the work, and I guess I've dedicated myself to do that. Excellent. I'm Verl Keeter, Muskogee, Oklahoma. Grew up near Stillwell, Oklahoma, out of the community of Mulberry. At about whatever age you begin to uh, wonder what's going on in the world, I was uh, primarily interested in hunting and fishing and in those things. I was up and down those creeks all the time and that's where the arrowheads were. And I'd find those when we plowed the fields. We'd find those arrowheads and things. My, my big question was, I was inquisitive about things. So 
I wanted to know how they were used, what they were, how they were made, and all that. We'll take a swat off with this and catch it right on the edge, not, not high up on it. Then we'll knock off the real nice concordial flakes. All you can do in making an arrowhead is remove material. You can't put it back on. So how you do the reduction stage of making arrowheads was the most important issue. To be a good flint napper, you need to know the nature of the rocks, where they are, what type they are, and I have a group who comes in flint napping here at my place. That's a good rock. Big part of it's trial and error for each individual. Each individual has a little different technique, and I furnish materials because I, I love to travel and I go where they see us and get it. I travel internationally, really. I make some trips into Old Mexico to get some obsidians out of uh, Guadalajara. Those who want to learn, I eliminate the excuse that they don't have good material. So I have it there and I, I know the different types of material and can explain how each type will be worked differently than another type. Every different rock comes from a different location. It'll have a story as to the people that used it and what they could use it for. Most peoples have feelings for their background, for the customs of the race of people that they're from. And I have that feeling. It's just an inward, innate feeling that I have that I owe something back to society. The Cherokee Nation uh, decided that, that I could be one of the national treasures. And I, I really have a, a deep sense of feeling that this art, it just must be preserved. And I feel like I have a responsibility to do what I can to preserve it. To love something this much, you have to love it to do what I do. And I suppose that uh, I'll die doing it. I'm 87 years old. I feel like it keeps my health going. I have a good hand-to-eye coordination. And at 87 years old, I have no restrictions. And I, I work hard at it. I look back, I don't know how you could ask for a better life than I've had. I did the things that I like to do, and yes, life has been good to me. Wahila LaHaye Loman was a Cherokee journalist whose extraordinary career took her from the skies of Oklahoma to the glitz and glamour of Hollywood and eventually into the White House. I do remember her with a glass of some kind of cocktail in her hand and just, she just seemed really fabulous and just someone that I'd really want to hang out with. She was born Wahila LaHaye in Claremore, Oklahoma in 1906. 
Her mother was a Scottish immigrant and her father was a Cherokee attorney who represented the tribe in Washington before Oklahoma statehood. While his father was a, a statesman, a politician in, in the Cherokee Nation, and I know she was very proud of that. Her father named her Wahilla after the Cherokee word for eagle. Wahilla's career as a journalist started as a teenager when she became the society editor for the Muskogee Daily Phoenix. She wrote for the Oklahoma A&M College publication, The Collegiate, but stepped away from the university to write for The Oklahoman and The Oklahoma City Times. By 1929, aviators ruled the headlines and pilots like Lady Heath and Amelia Earhart were garnering worldwide attention. Wahilla had a proposal for her editors at The Oklahoma City Times. If they paid for her flying lessons, she would write about her experiences in their newspaper. Her editors loved the idea, and Wahilla LaHaye completed her first solo flight after only 11 hours of instruction. She became known as the Times Flying Girl and continued to write for Oklahoma publications while transitioning into her new radio broadcasting career. Here's one you've danced too many times. It was at Kansas City's WHB where her career took off after she was promoted only one week into the job. Wahilla wrote hundreds of programs every month while performing six different shows under six different names and performed on-air advertisements at the studio from sun up to sundown. She took the industry by storm at stations across the country and by 1950, Wahilla became one of the nation's highest paid female advertising executives. Her advertising and public relations work involved promoting celebrities like Jimmy Durante, Peggy Lee, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Dorothy L'Amour, and dozens of others. Hey, that was fine. Now, what have you next? Wahilla still found time to write, and her semi-autobiographical article, Smile When You Call Me Pocahontas, was published in a 1952 issue of Collier's Weekly. The article serves to criticize those in her social circle who advise her to keep her Cherokee heritage a secret. I have to laugh, and yet have to crawl into a corner for a quiet cry over the things people say about Indians. Most of them are funny, and most of them are said completely without rancor or meanness, just with abysmal stupidity. She was very proud of her Cherokee heritage. I think she showed by her life's work that, you know, anybody can accomplish anything. In 1963, Wahilla moved to Washington, D.C., and soon established herself as a White House correspondent. Her task was covering then First Lady, Lady Bird Johnson. Wahilla continued her correspondent work into the Nixon administration. Covering an administration that was notoriously hostile to the press was no easy task, but Wahilla's tenacity and determination led to Cosmopolitan magazine designating her as one of Washington's witches, a term coined to describe an elite group of female reporters whose work in Washington was being recognized on a national scale. She was a journalist and wasn't afraid to, to mix it up. Obviously, she'd made an impact in, in, in Washington, no doubt. In September of 1973, Wahilla was installed by First Lady Pat Nixon as the 45th president of the Washington Press Club. Throughout her life, Wahilla LaHaye's work challenged conventional ideas of women's roles in both journalism and advertising, all the while advocating for better treatment of Native Americans and promoting their accomplishments in her articles. Though she chose to spend her retirement in Colorado Springs, she requested that when the time came for her to be laid to rest, that she be buried back home in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Let's talk Cherokee. Siyo uno le dawadoa. Siyo uno le dawadoa. Be quiet. Be quiet. Growing up in Colorado, Taylor and Britt Hensel say they felt a disconnect from their Cherokee heritage. Now, as young adults embarking on the beginning of their careers, they're using documentary film to explore what it really means to be Cherokee.
My name is Taylor Hensel. I am 25 years old and I am a graduate student at the University of Missouri. Ah! Ah! Oh my god. What? Can you see me? Oh, hi! Hello. My name is Britt Hensel. Um, I'm 24 years old and I am a writer. Okay, I'll, um, I'll do no, it. No, I'm gonna do it. Okay. What, what, what do you wanna say? I wanna say where we're from. We're from Colorado. We're from Fort Collins, Colorado. And we are sisters. Yes, we're sisters. <laughs> we are making a, a short documentary called Native and American. And basically what it is about is it's highlighting three different individual women and their journeys as they navigate their identity and their purpose within their native community, but also in larger American society. And it originated from a need to have a thesis topic for my graduate program. I'm studying documentary journalism. And so when I was thinking about my topic, I wanted it to have something to do with identity and address something that um, every human deals with. You know, answering the question, am I enough? Who am I? Where do I belong? And how do I empower myself and my community? When the film opportunity came about for her program, we knew we needed to figure out what this, what being Cherokee meant and what our culture was. As a kid, I remember my grandma saying, we're Cherokee, Cherokee yeah. and I just didn't have anything to pull from to understand what that even meant. We've always wanted to know this and always wanted to learn and grow in our culture and in the ways of our family, but it just had never been something that we had been given the opportunity to do because it just wasn't, our family didn't know much and our nativeness is important to us. We really want to learn and this was the opportunity to kind of go for that. So the, the filmmaking process for us always starts with connecting with somebody who can give us the perspective we need to approach the situation. We want to go to the source and we want to have someone lead us through it because we don't know. And so, I reached out to the Cherokee Nation and the response I got was great. We want to go to the source and be as authentic as possible. This is Danny McCarter. Hi. 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 I'm Brittany, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hello. How are you guys doing? All right. We just want to learn everything possible. Okay. So throw whatever you got at us. All right. Now this here is the winter home. Got the river canyon interwoven in the walls. That's the river canyon you see up there on the ceiling. We use it for everything. Really, river canyon is one of the hardiest, toughest plants you'll find. You can pull it up, take it somewhere and plant it, and it'll always grow and prosper. And that's really kind of like the Cherokee tribe. I mean, we've gone from different areas, but everywhere we go, we seem to grow and prosper. Now, stickball to the Cherokee people, it's a game nowadays. It's a social game. But in the earlier times, it was really an alternative to war. Of course, we start with small children. Oh, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> the thing we are most excited about is our genealogy re reveal. We're going to be meeting with experts, but having these records, they're going to be everything. Hi, I'm Gene Norris, and I'm the genealogist, a genealogist with the Cherokee Heritage Center, and I have come to show you your family history. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So when you do genealogy, you always start with yourself and you work your way back. And of course, you know the Cherokee line comes through uh, your dad, through your grandmother, Pam, and then down through Anna Lee Weaver. She is your direct link to the Cherokee Nation. Uh, now on the other side of the family, your great-grandmother's mother, Lena Etta Ross. Mm -hmm. She's also an original enrollee on the Dolls Roll, and it is through actually her father, okay. which is Robert Featherstone. Featherstone. Yeah, Featherstone Ross. Uh, and, and through him, it goes through his father, Andrew Wellington Ross. Wow. And this is Andrew Wellington Ross. This is his photograph. And the Cherokee for him comes to his mother, who was Eliza Severe. Well, I wanted to show you this. This is Elizabeth Lowry Severe's brother, George Lowry. I guess you could say George Lowry Jr. He was deputy chief under the first administration of John Ross. Uh, this is him when he went to something um, executively. Yeah, the thing about in, in, with Cherokee is that they ta were tattooed, they were pierced, uh, that was part of the culture, wow. both men and women. Uh, is there a Lowry? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're Lowry. So they descend from Elizabeth Lowry Severe, who's a sister to the George. 
his headstone is in the middle of Tahlequah Cemetery. Mm -hmm. and really? It's, yes. It's really impressive. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's like she's, she's, like she's a descendant of him as it well. Looks oh. like, yeah, it looks like the Washington Monument. Right. It's this big white pillar of marble. Wow. And it's up on How far hill. away is that from you? Oh, it's in town. It's not that far. Oh, we should talk oh, about yeah. that. A couple of miles. Yeah. is crazy. Captain of Light Horse. We've got a bigger light horse. There's more here too. An honest man, a spotless patriot, and a devout Christian. Wow. This type of stuff is uh, all I could have hoped for. Having something like this to see it and to yeah. I don't know. Makes me feel a little emotional. Really? Why? Why is it? I'm a good one. I'm not sad. Well, it's not my thing. You no, know, I just, it's cool. I know, it's not a lie. I just, I, I mean, I don't, I don't really have words for why. I just didn't think that this was gonna be like this. And I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah. Having something to connect to and to be able to kind of grow upon for my future. That's exciting. This whole experience has been crazy. And I'm just excited to tell our family about it. Never thought this way before. I have so many questions all of the time. I'm just always asking questions. The more you know, the more whole you can be and the more intentional you can be with your life and make decisions that honor who you are and your purpose. And I think that I want to be the person who goes and finds perspectives and shares with people and hopefully inspires hope or people to be better through me trying to be better. And that's why I love doing this. Talk slow. I'm going with this. Now be normal. I can't. Oh, it's a big one. What is that, a cicada? I might not too often. I've given up on you. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dodadago, ha'i. Wado.